Welcome to Isle Branch Baptist Church. We're so happy that you are with us this morning. If you are a guest, uh, we are so happy that you decided to spend your morning with us. Uh, we do have a Connect card in the, uh, not the seat, I'm still in the sanctuary, at the table behind you. Uh, so make sure that if you want to get to know a little bit more about us, you fill out that Connect card. Or you can also scan the back of your bulletin to get the QR or the uh, mobile version of the Connect card. Also, don't forget to grab a gift bag on your way out the door this morning. Uh, tonight at 6.30, we're continuing our apologetic series up in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, so make sure that you are there for that. We're going to uh, be looking at the support and evidence for uh, the divinity of Christ, or to put it even simpler, uh, look for the evidence that Jesus is God and that is who he claims to be. And so uh, today, even this morning, uh, Wayne is going to use one of the verses that we're going to spend a lot of time talking about tonight. So uh, make sure you are there for that at 6.30. If you missed last week, that's okay. Uh, refreshments will be provided, and we'll have some discussion time at the end of the night. This coming Saturday, there's a work day uh, at the playground. So if you are really into pulling weeds and uh, making children happy, uh, which hopefully you are one of those two, this might be a good thing for you to help get involved with uh, because VBS is a coming, and we do not want them tripping up on uh, a bunch of weeds that are in the playground. We want it to look good. So uh, we need your help with that. And so if you're free this Saturday, uh, we know what you're doing in the morning. Uh, today is the last day to collect for the Standing Rock missions trip. Uh, they leave in less than a week. And so we would like for them to have something to take to the missions field to help with the work there. So if you have any gift cards or a donation, uh, you can put them in the offering box or you can put them uh, up at the drop box on the secretary door in the church offices. Women on Mission is still collecting uh, for school supplies because school is like what, kids, like three and a half weeks away? We won't say nothing. We, won't, we don't say that here, but we just did. So uh, keep that in mind. The uh, donation center is up in between the restrooms and the welcome center, and there is a supply list in your bulletin. We're also still collecting for uh, VBS, which is very rapidly coming. So if you have some little Debbies or uh, chips or Capri Suns or anything like that, uh, that is also being collected up in the welcome center. Uh, volunteers for VBS, you're having a meeting on Sunday, July 30th, immediately after the second service uh, at 1230. So if you are not available for that for some reason, uh, please let Morgan know as soon as possible. So make sure that is on your calendar. And then one last thing, Sunday, August 6th is the, 6th is the annual ice cream social at the Gwen's house uh, from 6 to 830. If you've been here uh, before, if you've, if you've joined it before, uh, you know ice cream, there's going to be plenty of it. The only thing that they ask is that you would bring uh, dessert to share. And, of course, there's going to be games and fellowship as well. So we hope that you will join us for that. And also check out the bulletin, check out our Facebook page and our website for uh, a lot more stuff that we have coming up. Well, good morning, everybody. Brady bringing us down with the back-to-school announcement. Okay. <laughs> We got to get up. We got to get up. So y'all stand up and worship with us this morning and let's celebrate being a child of love. Amen.
church, let's continue in worship this morning with a song we learned last week from We the Kingdom. Jesus does. Who tells the sun to rise every morning? Colors the sky with the shades of his glory. Wakes us with mercy and love. Jesus does. Who holds the orphan, comforts the widow, cries for injustice, feels every sorrow, carries the pain of his children. Jesus does. a great God. Uh, we're so, this, this is why we're here. Amen. Mm -hmm. um, so good to be among brothers and sisters this morning. And uh, we just thank you for, for coming here and for being such an integral part of our worship. It makes our job, if you want to call this a job, it's not really a job. Mm -hmm. It's a privilege. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes our job so easy. You guys are great. And we're going to sing, you know, it wouldn't be a Sunday unless Wanda Bailey did a Chris Tomlin song. So we're going to do that this morning. <laughs> and this is an oldie and a goodie. And I know that, that you will enjoy it as much as we enjoy playing it.
the splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide And trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice how great is our god sing with me how great is our god and all will see how great how great is our god The lion and the lamb, how great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Look at God's word this morning. I wanted to share some prayer requests and spend some time in prayer before we come and look at Romans chapter 9 this morning. Uh, I wanted to remind you that Travis Belcher's funeral is tomorrow. It's here in the CLC at 11 o'clock. There'll be visitation with the family before that at 10 o'clock. And for those of you who knew Travis, you know uh, what, how much he meant to Olive Branch, how many years he served here in so many ways in children's ministry, youth ministry, in the facilities, uh, deacon chairman. Uh, he was a faithful servant, and his work here at Olive Branch for the Lord was just a small part of his amazing and great life. What a very humble man, intelligent man, and a godly man. So his funeral is tomorrow. Also, uh, I just heard this morning that Sarah Jones has asked us to pray for her mother, Sarah Crow. Uh, she is, uh, Sarah Jones is talking to doctors tomorrow about having Sarah come to the annex under hospice care. So we've been praying for her in her battle with cancer, and it sounds like it may be at the end, and it may be soon that God calls her home. So pray for uh, Sarah Crow and the f whole family. Also, uh, our 
missions team that we have been giving gift cards for <laughs> to purchase things in Standing Rock and that we have talked about for months is finally leaving. As Pastor Brady said, uh, we are leaving Friday to fly first from Raleigh to Minneapolis, then to Bismarck, North Dakota, and we will be there in Standing Rock Indian Reservation for a week. Uh, so next Sunday morning, I will not be with you. That's where I will be. Uh, but the team is myself and Donna Gerald and Karen Doffler, who was here in the first service, and Stacy Jenkins. So we are the four that are going. So I would ask you to pray for us. We will, uh, as you have heard about this trip many times, we'll be there for the week. Uh, the people will come and gather in a facility much like the CLC, the men, the women, the children, the youth, and we will feed them lunch and dinner each day and uh, minister to them in small groups and play games with the children, teach them Bible lessons, uh, do crafts with all of them. Uh, all ages like to do them there, not just the children, and uh, play games with them. Uh, but then also there are special events, uh, women's night on uh, Wednesday night and men's night on Tuesday night. There are also uh, other events that we will attend or planning to worship on Sunday morning in a uh, community and maybe also have uh, attend a powwow on Friday evening. So those are things that we will be doing. So I'm going to pray for us as I always pray when people travel away from home to minister for the Lord. I pray that the one going will be changed almost as much as the ones that will be ministered to. Uh, we will, of course, be sharing the gospel when we have the opportunity, showing the communities the love of Christ, and so pray for us for the entire trip. But I know when we come back, because uh, Donna's the only one who's been there herself to see it in person, uh, I know our hearts will be changed, and we'll have a different perspective on God and the work that He's doing there and around the world. That always happens. So I'm going to pray for uh, Dora and her family, and I'm going to pray for uh, our missions trip, and pray for Sarah Crow. So let's spend some time in prayer with the Lord. You are a great God, Lord. And we are so joyful this morning to be able to worship you with the songs that we have. You are our Father. We are your children. And the only reason we have that relationship is because of your love for us. And we sing to you, God, each Sunday, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for the joy that's in our heart and the thankfulness for who you are and what you have done for us. And we also know, Lord, that you hear us when we cry out to you. We've just studied how the Holy Spirit, you, God, intercede for us and pray for us with groanings that we don't even understand, when we don't even know how to pray. And we also learn that, Jesus, you are our brother, and you also are interceding and praying for us before the Father. So we are privileged and thankful that we can come to you in prayer, and that each Sunday as we do, it's not simply a list in the bulletin. It's not simply a moment in the service. But, Lord, this is a time when we humbly come before you to talk to you and ask you to hear us and answer. I pray for Sarah Crow, and I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen her. Lord, we know that she has battled this cancer, and we know, Lord, that she has been very ill for several weeks in this battle. And Lord, if it's now your time to call her home, I pray that you would do so in a very merciful way. I pray that you would give her comfort and rest in the days that you still have for her. And I pray that those days would be spent with her family and they would be joyful ones and they would be uh, filled with love. I pray for Sarah Jones and her children and husband and the whole family that you would also comfort them as well. Lord, I pray for Dora and pray that, uh, especially tomorrow, you would be with her and the whole family as they say goodbye to Travis and remember his life. We are thankful, Lord, that he's worshiping you today with you face to face, uh, no longer on this earth, but with you. And we are thankful for that. I pray tomorrow would be a celebration of you, Jesus, the life giver, 
and a celebration of Travis's life, dedication, service to so many and to you, Lord. And Lord, I look forward personally to this Friday when the four of us will fly to the Dakotas. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us safety in our travels. I pray that you would soften our hearts and open our eyes so that we are uh, prepared to see what you want us to see, prepared to uh, obey you and speak the words that you want us to, show your love and compassion the way you want to. Lord, strengthen us so that we don't tire and fill us with your spirit and fill us with joy so that our work for you is not a burden or a chore. I pray that you'd keep us healthy and I pray that you'd work out all the details so that the focus can be on our relationship with the people we will see and their relationship to God. I pray those who are unsaved would hear the gospel and believe. And I pray that those who are Christians, we would encourage them and they encourage us in our common faith. I pray that you'd be preparing uh, the hearts of those that we will go to. Lord, uh, you know what they need. You know who needs to be saved. You know everything about them. And you know us and our gifts and our experience and our testimony. And so, Lord, I pray that you would... uh, Work everything together so that our hearts share with their hearts to bring glory to you. I pray, Lord, that you would bless our time now as we look at your word. And Lord, as we try to understand the impossible and try to understand how you can be in control of everything and even choose people over another, yet all of us have a choice. Our minds are blown and it is hard to understand, but I pray that you would give that to us and helping us to understand. But more than that, Lord, I pray that we would learn to trust you and to trust you more. And I pray these things, Jesus, in your precious name. Amen. Is God just? When you look at our world and you see people in dire poverty and starvation, and you see others in opulent wealth that have more money to spend than they can. Is that fair? Is God a God who keeps his promises when he promises Christians to bless us, yet Christians suffer and hurt, and more so sometimes than people who are evil and don't even claim the name of God? Is that fair? Is that just? Is it fair or just that God would save some people and other people are not saved? Is God in control when you look at the chaos of this world and the violence of it, even in the nature that we see? Is God in control? So many critics answer those questions with the answer, no. They would say there is no God. When you see how unfair the world is, how unjust the world is, how chaotic and evil and violent it is, there cannot be a God. And you Christians who claim that you're going to heaven, but yet billions of others are burning in hell, that cannot be true. There can't be a God. Well, this morning, Paul answers a couple of objections to his critics about those questions. You see, Paul has been talking about our great salvation, how we're all sinners, but God saved us and his mercy and his love as we, by faith, believe and trust. It's not by the works that we do. It's by the work that Jesus Christ has done for us on our behalf. Then he explained how great that is in our lives as we live it out through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so you would think, as he often does in his letters, he will talk about our salvation or he will tell us something theological, some deep understanding of who God is and how we are to relate to him. And then the rest of his letter is very practical commands and advice, instructions of how to live our daily life with God. And Paul does that in this letter of Romans. He will, at chapter uh, 12, 
and on tell us how to practically live our life every day in light of God's salvation. But before he does that, he tells us about the nation of Israel, how God chose them, how they rejected Jesus, and what their future holds. That seems unusual to stick this right in the middle of what he's talking about. But there's a reason. It has to do with these questions I just asked you. You see, Paul preaches and he just taught that salvation is not by works, it's through faith in Jesus Christ. He's also taught that that salvation is to all, Jews and Gentiles. Well, if someone was a Jew and listening to Paul, they would have those questions. Well, how can that be fair? Uh, Israel is God's chosen nation, and God made promises to them. And, And we haven't seen them fulfilled yet. If he's making promises to Gentiles, are those promises going to be fulfilled? Is he going to keep his word there? It doesn't seem like he's kept them to us Jews. If Gentiles are part of this, and now it looks like there's something new, has God given up on Israel? Is that fair? So Paul wants to answer those questions about God's sovereignty and his fairness and his justice. He also wants to show that God's not done with Israel just because at that time as he's writing, most of the Jewish people had rejected Jesus. And so he wants to answer the critics before he then goes on to tell us how to live our Christian life. And he does this for two reasons. One, he wants to show us how the promises God has made to us are going to come true. Remember, chapter, the end of chapter 8 is about how our salvation is secure and how God promises that it's not the work that we do, it's Him that's going to keep us secure and we will see Him in heaven. These promises of a future with God and a salvation that's complete, these are promises that we as Christians trust in and stake our whole life and future on. Well, if God doesn't keep his promises, that's a shaky foundation. We could not get any of that. And the Jewish people could say to Paul, well, Paul, it seems like God's made these promises to us, and he didn't keep them. And Paul wants to show that God has kept his promise. He hasn't failed, even though the Jewish people have, for the most part, rejected Jesus. But also he wants to show, as a Jew, that he loves his brothers and sisters. He's not a traitor, although that's how most Jews saw him. They saw him as one who was abandoning their faith and had created a new religion and was proclaiming it in the synagogues. And so many of it saw it as blasphemy, and he's a traitor. Paul wants to show, no, that's not the case. And so he shows us as he teaches us in Romans chapter 9 about God's justice, fairness, and sovereignty. I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies to me through the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the benefit of my brothers and sisters, my own flesh and blood. Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying he would rather go to hell if he knew that meant that his Jewish brothers and sisters would go to heaven. I'm going to be honest with you. I have never felt that way. And I'm sure a lot of you are with me. That shows you how selfish I am. When I think about heaven, I'm thanking Jesus for saving me. I'm thinking about my future. I'm thinking about being with him and glory forever. I want that. I want to be with my God and be there. I don't want to give that up so someone else can have it. I want them to choose for themselves and come and join me. But I'm not going to give it up for them. And I believe Paul here is not exaggerating. He's using two uh, to testify for him. He's talking about Christ and the Holy Spirit. These are his witnesses that he is telling the truth. And so I would just pause here and remind us that should be the heart that we have 
for those who are lost. And I pray, and I've been praying my whole life to have that heart. I'm not there yet. But we have to see the lost as God does. People he loves so much that Jesus died for them. And he wants everyone to be saved. That's why he's patient with people, wanting them to come to repentance. And God gave his son so that we could be saved. The father went to all the links that you could go to to make sure we were saved. And we're often unwilling to go next door or start a conversation or even invite someone to church. We're paralyzed by fear. We're paralyzed by how we will uh, be perceived or what someone will say or whether we'll be rejected or seem stupid or foolish or we don't know what to say. And so we don't say anything to people we know desperately need the gospel. That's not the heart of God. Paul had the heart of God, and we must have it too, because so many need to hear. Paul goes on to talk about the Israelites, about how they are blessed beyond any of the other nations. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service, and the promises. The ancestors are theirs, and from them, by physical descent, came the Christ who is God over all, praised forever. Amen. The Israelites had all the advantages. God gave them the law, gave them the word of God. God gave them a temple service so that they could worship God. God chose them as a nation and adopted them as his own. God made promises to them, made covenants with him, them. They, they were the ones who had Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were the ones through whom Jesus Christ was born. The Jewish people had all the advantages, yet, for the most part, in Paul's day, they had rejected Jesus. Now, someone might say, well, God's failed. He didn't keep his promise. He gave all these advantages to this nation, and they failed him. But Paul says, no, it's because Israel has rejected Christ. And he says, Israel's rejection doesn't mean God's word has failed. And that's what he he says next. Now, it's not as though the word of God has failed, because not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. So he's going to make two points. One is that Abraham had many children. But not all of those children were the promised children. So therefore, it's always been the case that not everyone who's an actual biological DNA descendant of Abraham would be Israel. So in a sense, what is happening in that day does not surprise because it's always been the case. And he'll talk a little bit about how this nation was chosen. So he talks about Abraham and Sarah and the birth of their son Isaac. Now this picture, Sarah looks really good for 90 years old, doesn't she? And Abraham for 100. We all know their story about a miracle child born in old age, but Isaac wasn't Abraham's only son. He had a son previously, Ishmael. We also read after Sarah died that he also had other children. Amazing, after 100 years old, right? (laughs) The point is this, that Abraham had lots of children. Only one, Isaac, was the true Israel, was the promised son, was the son through whom the promise would come and the covenant would come and all those advantages that Paul talked about. So not all Israel, not all of Abraham's children was Israel. He also talks 
about, we'll skip over this for time. He also talks about uh, Isaac's children, Abraham's grandchildren. Isaac had a wife, Rebekah. And I chose this picture because this is, these are the worst drawn babies I've ever seen. I don't know who is the artist of this, but look at those babies. They are the strangest looking things. Abraham had, uh, excuse me, Isaac's wife, Rebecca, had twins, Esau and Jacob. Esau was born first, Jacob second, yet Jacob was the one through which the promises came. So again, they're both Israel in a sense because both are descendants of Abraham, but not both are the children of promise. Only one, Jacob. And in fact, this is where it kind of twists a little bit. Why was it Jacob and not Esau? That's what Paul says next. And not only that, but Rebekah conceived children through one man, our father Isaac. For through her, though, excuse me, for though her sons had not been born yet or done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to election might stand, not from works, but from the one who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. So Paul's trying to show that it's always been the case. That not everyone who's Israel, in a sense, a descendant of Abraham, is Israel. The, the chosen ones, the saved ones. But then he goes even farther and says, this choice to choose Isaac, but specifically as he talks about it here, choosing Jacob, had nothing to do with Jacob. Rebekah was told the older would serve the younger before they were born. And notice here, Paul specifically says it's not because of the works that they did. It's not as though God looked into the future and he saw that Jacob was going to be the better son. And so God chose him because he was better, more righteous, more godly. No, before they did anything. And in fact, you could argue that Esau was the better son. Jacob tricked Esau out of his birthright. Jacob stole the blessing from Esau. Esau didn't have any desire really for the blessing and the birthright, and that was his choice and his fault. But it was Jacob who tricked him out of it, stole it from him. Even in, later on in his life, Jacob is still a trickster scheming all the time. Esau and Jacob, when they're reunited years after Jacob had to leave because he stole Esau's blessing, Jacob's afraid. He's going to get revenge on me. And in fact, you read the whole story, it's kind of humorous how he doesn't want to go first. So he starts sending everything ahead of him. <laughs> he, you know, he's sending everything ahead of him in case Esau kills it and everything. So he's sending him gifts ahead and he's sending everything ahead so that Esau was not going to hurt him. But Esau was compassionate, forgiving. You know, Esau accepted him. Welcome her to stay with him. So Esau reacted as Esau. Jacob expected him to act like Jacob. I guess that's what Jacob would have done. So you can argue that. But the point is, it didn't matter what their good works were in their lives. God chose one over the other. In fact, it says, I have loved Jacob and hated Esau. Well, that doesn't seem fair especially when it's not based on their works. It's not I love Jacob because he was a godly man and I hated Esau because he was a sinful man. It's God saying I love Jacob because I wanted to and I hated Esau because I wanted to. Now, if you want to understand the exact phrase a little bit better, so it maybe doesn't sound as harsh to you when you hear it in a bigger context, uh, this is a quote from Malachi chapter 1. And in that quote, God's really talking about the nation of Israel and the nation of Edom. And in the Old Testament, often the name Jacob is used as the name for Israel. And Esau is used as the name for Edom. And so there, 
what God is saying to Malachi really is that God has loved the nation of Israel and he has judged the nation of Edom. As you read there, he talks about Edom's judgment. But even if you wanted to, to say, well, it's more than just the nations, it's the actual children themselves, because here he's talking about their birth. And before their birth, he's talking about the individual children. Think about what Jesus says in the Gospels. He tells us if we want to be a disciple of his, we have to hate our family and love him. Now, do you think Jesus is saying to us that our spouse, our children, our extended family, we're supposed to have anger, bitterness, malice towards them? Of course not. It's a degree of relativity. Our love for Jesus and our following him, our love for him should be so high. Remember, it's supposed to be with all of our, all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength that our love for him in comparison to the love for our family is like hatred in comparison because we think of love and hate as opposites. If you're at one extreme, the other extreme's over here. And if we're loving God all the way over here, our family's left behind in the sense of that love. And even that's hard to understand, isn't it? And we could talk about that's another sermon for another day, <laughs> what that means. But I'm trying to show you that it's not necessarily God had animus and viciousness towards Esau was that he loved Jacob so much more because that was God is a God of love and that was his choice. And when uh, the uh, famous London preacher Spurgeon was asked about this verse and a woman came to him and said, I can't understand how God hated Esau. He said, I have a harder time understanding why God loved Jacob. And think about it in that way. And that's sort of the next point that Paul makes. But this part of the scripture here is to remind us that God is faithful. He, did, he, kept, he made promises to Israel and he's kept them. Because there still are people who believe and follow Jesus and are part of the remnant of Israel. Because it's always been the case not, that not all Israel is Israel. It's still the case in Paul's day and still the case today. And so God's promises haven't failed, and God hasn't failed. Then Paul talks about this question of fairness. What should we say then? Is there injustice with God? Absolutely not. It doesn't sound fair, does it? I loved Jacob and hated Esau. How is that fair? Especially when it had nothing to do with their character. He talks about how... God is merciful to whom he wants to be. He references, although he doesn't talk about it specifically, the event in the book of Exodus where the Israelites worshiped the golden calf. For that disobedience, all of them should have been killed. But God only killed 3,000 of them. He showed mercy. All of them deserved to die, but not all of them did die. And so in the next chapter, if you read Exodus, when Moses wants to see God, God reveals himself to Moses, and this is what God says. I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Paul says, so then it does not depend on human will or effort, but on God who shows mercy. So in a real sense, every single human being deserves to die and spend eternity in hell and be hated by God. But God also is a loving God and he shows mercy and he shows compassion. But since he's the creator, he has the right to whom he will show that mercy and that compassion. Paul uses the example of Pharaoh. Pharaoh hardened his heart against God when Moses went to him and said, let my people go. Because of that, God could have killed him. But God didn't. 
God was merciful to Pharaoh to give him another chance, and another chance, and another chance, and another chance. And with each of those chances, he could have repented and let the people go, but he didn't. And in time, God started hardening his heart because Pharaoh had already hardened it completely rock solid. And then God used Pharaoh to bring glory to himself. Isn't this one of the, the greatest stories that's told worldwide about the uh, Egyptians, uh, the Israelites fleeing Egypt? And freedom. And so that's what Paul says. For the scripture tells Pharaoh, I raised you up for this reason, so that I may display my power in you, and that my name may be proclaimed in the whole earth. Paul says, So then he has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. Since all of us are sinners, what we all deserve is God's wrath. But God is merciful. And he does give mercy. If, there is God, if there's a judge who has the right to pass sentence, he can give a just sentence and he can give mercy. He has the right to do both. We know that today when people are in death row, the governors can give clemency. They can give mercy. And that's his right to do. Or the person can be executed. And both are just. God, as the God of the universe and our creator, has the right to kill all of us and send us all to hell, or he has the right to choose to be merciful and have compassion on others. Now, that doesn't seem to answer the question. That doesn't seem fair either, <laughs> okay? It doesn't seem fair that God would only choose some and not choose others. And so what you might expect from Paul to say is to talk, start talking about our free will. Because as much as that is true, and that's 100% true, it's also 100% true that all of us have free will and everything we do is because we have made a choice. We're not forced by God to do it. We're not forced by Satan to do it. You might argue if someone holds a gun to your head and you do something that you wouldn't normally do, you're forced to do it. Okay, but someone has done that in evil to make you do that. What I'm talking about is our choices that we make to sin, to not sin, to believe in Jesus, to not believe. It's all us individually. And that's true for every single person who's ever been born. They choose whether to follow God or not. It's 100% our choice. And it's 100% God's sovereignty to choose. And we try to put them together and make it 50-50 or 75-25 or try to wrap around how it can work out. You're not going to do it. That's impossible. But we're told both truths, and so we should believe both and trust God that he knows it all. God chooses he chose Jacob, but also Jacob chose God, and Esau didn't. Each of them chose, and one was chosen by God, 100% God and 100% us. Don't try to figure it out, okay? But Paul then doesn't do that. That's not, that's not his argument next. His argument next is basically shut up. Stop criticizing God. He is your creator. That's his argument. For you will say to me, therefore, why then does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? Right? That's what you would normally say. How can this be, If Esau had no choice, it seems, how can he stand before God and say to God, God, my excuse is you chose my brother. And that's why my life turned out as it did. No. Paul says, Who are you, a mere man, to talk back to God? Well, what does form say to the one who formed it? Why did you make me like this? And then Paul talks about the potter and clay. And it's an image that you can understand easily. 
And God used it with his nation back in the prophets in the Old Testament. God, as the creator, creates us. We know this physically. We know that who we are, we had no decision over. My parents, I didn't decide them. How tall I am and the DNA I have and what I look like, I had no choice over that. So we understand in that sense that God made each one of us uniquely and individually because he is our creator and he can make us any way he wants to. As we've already said, it's harder to understand how that makes sense when it comes to salvation, when it comes to heaven and hell. But again, Paul's argument here is shut up, <laughs> to trust God. He's the one who has the right because he's the creator. Has the potter no right over the clay to make from the same lump one piece of pottery for honor and another for dishonor? And what if God, wanting to display his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience objects of wrath prepared for destruction? And what if he did this to make known the riches of his glory on objects of mercy that he prepared beforehand for glory? On us, the ones he's also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. So Paul's saying God is in control and he's sovereign. He's the potter. He can make the clay any way he wants to. And he can choose to have mercy. And listen to the beautiful mercy we receive here. Again, we're to make known the riches of his glory on objects of mercy. That's you and me. Those who are saved are objects of God's mercy. To show us the riches of his glory. But notice again that he prepared beforehand. He's prepared us for all this before we were even born. But he again says not only the Jews, but also the Gentiles. Paul goes on to explain a little bit more. We won't spend any time here. But he quotes two Old Testament passages that show that God would save Gentiles one day. Remember, there were Jews that said, Paul, what you're preaching is, is heresy. And he's saying, no, the Old Testament always showed that Gentiles would be saved. And then the other passage he quotes shows that it's always been the case that only a part of Israel were always the true Israel, were always true believers, a remnant. That's always been the case. So what Paul has been preaching has come from the Old Testament. It's not something new. And you can conclude this part of it by saying that God is sovereign. I know we've gone through a lot of mental gymnastics this morning. And maybe it's a type of uh, a lesson and sermon that uh, doesn't hit your heart as much, as much as it hits your brain and then it scrambles it. And you leave confused, maybe more than answers. But I've been saying the words over and over throughout the message Anchor what you have heard this morning with these three truths. God is sovereign, God is just, and God is faithful. If you leave with that this morning, that's going to stick to your ribs, as you say, when you eat and go with you in this week. Because you look at life and it doesn't seem fair, remember God is just. And when your life is in chaos this week, remember that he's in control. And remember, when it feels like God has abandoned you or that his promises are never going to come to fruition, he's always faithful and he will keep his promises. If God has taught you other things about his mind and how they work, I'd love to hear it because I, I don't understand it all myself. Let's go to our God in prayer. We are thankful, Lord, this morning that you are a just God, a sovereign God, a faithful God. Lord, we don't understand it all. And Lord, we never will. I'm thankful, Lord, you teach us so much and explain so much so that we have enough to know your heart and to know who you are and to understand ourselves. But Lord, I am thankful too that there are mysteries and things we can't understand. Because it always reminds me, Lord, that we are your creation. 
and we're small and feeble-minded and weak and frail, and you are the God of the universe. And so in that, Lord, it reminds us of our place and it humbles us. It also gives us something to look forward to when we see you. Lord, I don't know if you'll give us every single answer, but Lord, I know that all of our questions will fade in the background and our knowledge will be complete when we see you in heaven. And for that, we are thankful this morning too. I pray, Lord, now that we would respond to your word, that you would also uh, be glorified in the words that we will sing as we worship you one more time together. And I pray, Jesus, in your name, amen. Let's stand together and sing. I'll be here to meet you, to pray with you.
pray and then we will be dismissed. Lord Jesus, we are thankful for what we have been uh, hearing in your word through the book of Romans. We are grateful for the reminder that uh, while the world may seem broken, it is not so broken that, that you cannot fix it or that it is not in control. We're thankful for the, the words of Paul and, and that uh, the great example that he has left to us of how we are to, to love our brothers and our sisters and and even behind that, we, we know that the reason that Paul could say what he says in verse 3 is because he knew the one to whom it really happened, the one who really was a curse, the one who really was cut off for the sake of his brothers and for his sisters, that it was you, Jesus, who was, was cut down in his life so that we could be brought into your family. So we're grateful for that. We're, we're thankful for these words that we have sung and that we have heard. And it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. <laughs>